Maturity means we discern our part in God's will. Maturity means we are focused on others and not ourselves. 
Maturity means our priorities are in order. Maturity means we are forgiving people who are not saying they're sorry. <laughs> Maturity means we take responsibility for our words and actions. It means we stop making excuses. Maturity means accountability. Maturity means we don't react, we respond. Meaning, if I react to something, the nature of, of what is going on causes me to react. Right. Are you following me? Yep. But when I respond, I respond in the opposite spirit. Meaning I'm spirit-led, not circumstance-driven. One of the things that old man of God said to me once, he looked me dead in the face and said, Adam, I'm going to tell you something. And I said, what's that? And he goes, the devil pushes, but God leads. All right. Amen. All right. That's right. Maturity means we can discern the difference between a push and a lead. Okay. Maturity causes us to understand that our choices affect other people as much as they affect us. Let me give you an example. David was a man and he made mistakes and um, he's kind of like, you know, one of the main characters in the Bible, really. And so he liked to sleep with women and he, he looked at a woman and he slept with her and then he had her husband killed. More of the story, right? So he's like, Nathan the prophet comes to him, gives him a parable. David figures out the parables about him. Okay. He repents, he writes Psalm 51. But God said this thing to him that's really, really scary. God said to him, because of this sin, he said this. He said, the sword will not depart from your house. Okay? Now, Jesus was manifested in the flesh, born of a virgin. He comes. You know what Herod's doing? He's slaughtering Jewish people with a sword. When the time of his son David, the son of David Christ, and the time of the Messiah's birth, that word over David's life was still being fulfilled even though he was dead. Let me say it like this. The choices we make today really affect tomorrow. Whether for better or for worse. I'll give you a better example. A better example of that is when Samuel was born, the word of the Lord was rare in his day. You guys remember that? Right. It was basically saying that there was not a lot of vision, there was not a, a lot of revelation. So we saw more revision and more revelation in just five minutes than they saw for years. And so the situation wasn't that good. There was no fire on the altar. Eli, his sons, were like wicked sinners. They stole from the offering. They lived immoral. They lived like most pastor's kids live today. Jesus' name. And so they lived in such a way that there was no revelation. So God had a solution. Samuel became that solution. And so the word of the Lord went from being rare in Samuel's day to in the days of Elisha. I want to get you somewhere here because this really ties together. When Elisha was about to receive the mantle from Elijah, and Elijah was going to get sucked up into heaven. There's something that Elijah had to go through that was part of his maturity process that was going to allow him to receive a spiritual inheritance or mantle, so to speak. He had to press through rejection. Every single time Elijah moved to another city, Elijah kept trying to tell Elisha, Elisha, stay here. He was a spiritual father rejecting a son. Now, this is reality because there's people who have walked through this. There's people who are damaged from rejection within church. And so this is a very real thing here. Not something to just look over, but it's something to actually understand. And so Elisha uh, says, no, I'm just going to, as long as my soul lives and as long as the Lord lives and as long as I'm alive, pal, I'm following you because you're carrying what I need for my destiny. He was able to put his feelings aside and his hunger 
his spiritual hunger mattered more than his feelings. He was able to press through rejection so that he could receive that which God had for him. Part of the maturity process in our life is us pressing through rejection. Because if you're going to live a life where you carry the cross and you really follow Jesus, you're going to deal with two things, betrayal and rejection. And it's important that you respond, not react. And so he pressed through this thing and he followed Elijah and he continued to follow Elijah. Now, when he first went into the city, okay, the first city he went into, let's go there. Just why I want to show you something here. I think this can be a blessing to you. 2 Kings 2, and it came to pass when the Lord would take Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went up from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, tarry here, I pray, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave. So they went down to Bethel and the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elijah and said unto him, knowest not that thou Lord will take away thy master today? And he said, Yeah, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, as his soul liveth, I will not leave. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were in Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yeah, I know it. Hold your peace. New Jersey, yes, I know it. Just be quiet. Shut up. Shut up. That's what he told them. Verse 6. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, as thy soul liveth, I will not leave. And the two went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off. And the two stood by Jordan, and Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided. So the two went on over dry ground. Verse 9, And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elijah, Ask, what shall I do for thee before I be taken away? And Elijah said, Pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me, when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall be not so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, and behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up into a whirlwind into heaven. And Elijah saw it and said, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had smitten the waters, they parted and Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah does rest on Elisha. And there came to meet him, and they bowed themselves to the ground before him. Now, let me explain to you. He had to press through this rejection that is a real thing to receive what God had for him. Now, I'm saying this because this is a reality in life that everyone deals with is the issue of rejection. Some people are rejected by leaders. Some people are rejected by family. Some people are rejected by themselves. Some people cannot stand themselves. And so there is a self-hatred or a rejection. They're actually rejecting themselves. I know it doesn't make any sense. It almost sounds like psychobabble, but it's true. There's really people who actually hate themselves. Yeah. Are you with me? Yes. And so he had to press through this thing. But when he was pressing through, do you notice that the word of the Lord went, uh, wherever they went, it was like the word of the Lord was there. Do, do you notice that the word of the Lord was in each city that they went? Yeah. Okay. Well, do you know what that is? That was the fruit of Samuel's life. 
Samuel is the one who had the school of the prophets. See, the whole prophetic musician thing, it didn't even originate with David. It was before that. It was with Samuel. And see, Samuel, his prophetic schools, was the forerunner to David's tabernacle. Yeah, there's always a forerunner to the things that God establishes. And so it's important in our life that we can discern the forerunner or the token or the thing that God sends before to say, hey, there's more coming. Elijah's servant, he saw a cloud of rain. A little, little, little cloud, and he said, the rain is coming. He was able to discern. The people who received John the Baptist's message understood that was, there was more to John the Baptist's message. And the ones who really received that message understood who Jesus was, and they followed him. John's real disciples, the ones who really followed John closely, when John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, it says that his disciples no longer followed him, and they followed Jesus True prophetic ministry is pointing people to Jesus, not drawing people to ourselves. Amen. Amen. You follow me? Yeah. And so they understood the next step in their journey, meaning they were maturing in understanding where God was leading them. You understand? This is a huge thing. And so what we look at when we look at that story with Elisha and Elijah is the first thing that he does is he rips off his old garments. And so... A lot of Christians, unfortunately, they live in bondage to the past and afraid of the future, and the devil robs the present moment through that kind of thinking. God wants us to mature in how we think and how we see reality. We've been given the mind of Christ so that we can live from His perspective, not from ours. We are called to live from Christ's perspective, and not only that, we're called to respond and to live like he lived in this earth. And for that to take place in, in, in just practical reality, just speaking how things really are, we need to just really grow up. There's people who've been in church for 30 years, and it's like they have diapers on still, and they still go into the bathroom in their pants. We need to stop being offended with each other, and the church needs to grow up. We need to learn to love one another. We need to learn to... Maturity means action. It means responsibility. It means the things that we're praying about, we actually need to start doing. The things that we really believe, we need to do them and not just talk about them. It's real important that we put what we believe into practice and into action, or else we really don't believe it. When we sing Jesus is worthy and don't tell people about him, we don't really believe he's that worthy. You tell me, well, I believe in healing. Well, when was the last time you laid hands on the sick? See, it has to come to a place where we move into action. And so Jesus himself was fully God and fully man. Are you guys with that? Fully God, fully man. He was born of a virgin, which means he's a man, and he manifested in the flesh, which means he was God. He's the son of man, Ben Adam, and he was the son of God. The Bible says the God of Israel doesn't sleep or slumber. And so Jesus, he sleeps in the boat. Because he's fully man. He can sleep in the storm. He's fully God. So this is who Jesus is. But even him, he had to mature and he had to grow up in the natural world. You understand? And so in the kingdom of God, there's something that we've started to understand. We fully don't understand it. The church fully, by and large, doesn't understand it. We kind of get it. The Bible says that when one sinner repents... It's greater than 99 righteous people just being righteous and doing what they do. Right? right? But we think that if we're going to fast and pray for the rest of our life, that that's going to move God. But you know what moves God even more than that? When someone changes the way they think about who God really is by the way you live. All of heaven rejoices over one sinner that repents. So when we really believe that, our priorities will change and we'll be less focused on ourselves and more focused on others who don't know Jesus. I'm not saying that as an evangelist. I'm not even an evangelist. I'm not saying that because I'm, I'm, even, I'm not even saying that for the reason to stir you with the flesh. I'm saying that because 
we as people, I, I'll say it me first, I am a selfish person who God is breaking that selfishness out of me. Now there's people who will not tell you that behind a microphone, but I will tell you that. We need to be broken of that. Everything in our culture makes us like that. We think we're entitled to it, and it's evil to God. There was a guy in our church, one of our elders, a real old guy, real nice guy. I shouldn't say that if he's watching, he'll kill me. But he's a real nice guy, and uh, he has a real gentle voice. And if you don't listen real carefully, you won't hear what he's saying. But there was this woman with a spirit of infirmity, and she had this spirit of infirmity for 38 years, and the woman was bent over like this. Do you remember that story in the Bible? Yeah. And uh, so he said something, and he goes like this. He goes, yeah, you know you're sick when all you can see is yourself. <laughs> you see what I mean? See, she was bent over, and her, the only reality that was reality to her was herself. And so that's what sickness is in the spirit. When we're, when we're selfish and all we can focus on is ourself, our well-being, our promotion, our blessing, us. When, all, when that's the only thing that consumes us, we're sick and we need to be healed. And so I really believe that as we mature us, God is going to align our backs so that we have a backbone, but so that we're not just focused on ourselves. I don't know about you, but I take notice when God responds to me, okay? And God responds to me when I'm responding to the needs of other people. When Jesus taught his disciples how to pray and how to live, he, he said, when you fast, when you pray, when you give. Remember that. I wrote that in the manual, by the way. So these three whens of Christianity, I call it. And so the first when was when you give. Don't give your alms in front of men to be seen of men, for you don't have a reward, okay? Then he tells them when you pray. Then he tells them when you fast. He said that in, a, in an order. And the order is this. When you give to the poor, that's what alms is. It's not tithes and offerings. He's talking about giving to the poor in that context. He says when you give to the poor... Don't give to the poor to be seen by people, to be honored by people. And then he goes on and says, when you pray, don't stand on the street corner and let everyone know that you're part of this great prayer thing and you, all you do is pray. And don't make yourself seem to be more spiritual than the rest of the people because you pray so much. Okay? When you fast, don't afflict yourself so people look and go, wow, this guy is a really spiritual guy. He's fasting all the time. That's not the heartbeat of it. The heartbeat of it is to do it for the Lord's eyes and not for man. Because he's the Lord and not men. Meaning we shouldn't be motivated by what people think or feel about us. We should be motivated by the Lord and what he sees. But the reason he taught them first to give is because he's saying, listen, if you expect to receive something from me, you have a need, which is me. Right? Right? And if you expect to receive something from me, then you better give something to someone who's in need. One of the reasons I believe that we do not see the power of God in ways that we're hungering and thirsting for is because I honestly believe that when we withhold good, when it's in our power to do good to others, if we do not release what is in our power to do, God will not release what is his power to do. Meaning, if we want God to do what he said, we need to do what he said. Are you guys okay? I'm saying that if we withhold the good that is in our power to do, why is he going to fill us with this supernatural power, this extra power, this greater works, this all this stuff that people continuously talk about, if we do not do what's in our power now to do? If someone is, it's the same concept, if someone is not going to tithe if they make $1,000 a week, they're not going to start tithing if they start making $5,000 a week. If you're faithful with little, you'll be faithful with much. And, and I believe that if we're faithful, and as we mature, our desire is to be faithful. You see, our desire is not to be recognized. Our desire is not to be the hottest thing in town. But our desire is to be faithful to the Lord as we mature. I really believe that that's the strongest desire within the life of a believer is to really mature 
and, and to do the things that God's called us to do. So Jesus himself, I'm jumping around, back to in the kingdom they celebrate sinners coming home to the Father's house, right? It says that heaven rejoices. Now, there's something else that I think that we've yet to fully understand. I know that I don't fully understand it, but I'm learning, is that in the kingdom of God, one of the things that's celebrated is maturity. That's why the Jewish people in their culture, they had a bar mitzvah. See, maturity means accountability. And it's something that's celebrated in the kingdom. The age of accountability, I believe it was 12 years old. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. I believe that Jewish speaking, in the Jewish culture, the age of accountability is 12. And that's when a young man or a young woman would actually be accountable for their actions. And, and it's when they would have to know right and wrong and all these other things. All right? And so... Through Jesus' age of accountability, in that age, he knew who his father was. Okay? What was he doing? He was in the temple. He was speaking. They were astonished at his wisdom. Okay? And he said this. His parents come to him, and, and he says to them, Don't you know I must be about my father's business? He's telling his natural dad, Hold on, pal. I know who my real dad is. And it's his business that I'm about. Now, you may look at that and say, oh, here's nice little Jesus. He's so sweet. But you know what he just said? He just said that when he came into the age of accountability, he knew who he was and he knew who his father was. And that means he knew his assignment. Often, people say, I don't know what God's called me to do. I don't know what to do. The issue is not that you don't know what to do. The issue is that you don't know who you are.